A Delicate Affair by Grace E. King. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. A Delicate Affair by Grace E. King. But what does this extraordinary display of light mean? ejaculated my aunt. The moment she entered the parlor from the dining room, it looks like the kingdom of heaven in here. Jules, Jules, she cried, come and put out some of the light. Jules was at the front door letting in the usual Wednesday evening visitor, but now he came running in immediately with his own invention in the way of a gas stick, a piece of broom handle notched at the end and began turning one tap after the other until the room was reduced to complete darkness but what do you mean now jules screamed the old lady again pardon madame answered jules with dignity it is an accident i thought there was one still lighted an accident an accident do you think i hire you to perform accidents for me you are just through telling me that it was accident made you give me both soup and gumbo for dinner to-day but accidents can always happen, madame, persisted Jules, adhering to his position. The chandelier, a design of originality in its day, gave light by what purported to be wax candles standing each in a circlet of pendant crystals. The usual smile of ecstatic admiration spread over Jules's features as he touched the match to the simulated wicks and lighted into life the rainbows in the prisms underneath. It was a smile that did not heighten the intelligence of his features, revealing as it did the toothless condition of his gums. What will Madame have for her dinner tomorrow? Looking benignantly at his mistress and still standing under his aureole. Do I ever give orders for one dinner with the other one still on my lips? I only ask, Madame. There is no harm in asking. He walked away, his long, stiff white apron rattling like a petticoat about him, catching sight of the visitor still standing at the threshold. Oh, madame, here is Mr. Horace. Shall I let him in? Idiot, every Wednesday you ask me that question, and every Wednesday I answer the same way. Don't you think I could tell you when not to let him in without your asking? Oh, well, madame, one never knows. It is always safe to ask. The appearance of the gentleman started a fresh subject of excitement. Jules, Jules, you have left that front door unlocked again. Excuse me, said Mr. Horace. Jules did not leave the front door unlocked. It was locked when I rang, and he locked it again most carefully after letting me in. I have been standing outside all the while the gas was being extinguished and relighted. Ah, very well then. And what is the news? She sank into her armchair, pulled her little card table closer, and began shuffling the cards upon it for her game of solitaire. I never hear any news, you know. She, nodding toward me, goes out, but she never learns anything. She is as stupid tonight as an empty bottle. After a few passes, her hands, which were slightly tremulous, regained some of their wonted steadiness and brilliancy of movement and the cards dropped rapidly on the table. Mr. Horace, as he had got into the habit of doing, watched her mechanically, rather absent-mindedly, retailing what he imagined would interest her from his week's observation and hearsay, and Madame's little world revolved, complete for her, in time, place, and personality. It was an old-fashioned square room with long ceiling and broad, low windows heavily curtained with stiff silk brocade faded by time into mellowness the tall white-painted mantle carried its obligation of ornaments well a gilt clock which under a glass case related some brilliant poetical idol and told the hours only in an insignificant aside according to the delicate politeness of bygone french taste flanked by duplicate continuations of the same idol in companion candelabra also under glass, Sèvres, or imitation Sèvres faces, and a crowd of smaller objects to which age and rarity were slowly contributing an artistic value. An oval mirror behind 
threw replicas of them into another mirror receiving in exchange the reflected portrait of madame in her youth and in the partial nudity in which innocence was limned in madame's youth there were besides mirrors on the other three walls of the room all hung with such careful intent for the exercise of their vocation that the apartment in spots extended indefinitely the brilliant chandelier was thereby quadrupled and the furniture and ornaments multiplied everywhere and most unexpectedly into twins and triplets producing such sociabilities among them and forcing such correspondences between inanimate objects with such hospitable insistence that the effect was full of gaiety and life although the interchange in reality was the mere repetition of one original a kind of phonographic echo the portrait of monsieur madame's handsome young husband hung out of the circle of radiance in the isolation that wherever they hang always seem to surround the portraits of the dead old as the parlors appeared madame antedated them by the sixteen years she had lived before her marriage which had been the occasion of their furnishment she had travelled a considerable distance over the sands of time since the epoch commemorated by the portrait indeed it would require almost documentary evidence to prove that she who now was arriving at eighty was the same atalanta that had started out so buoyantly at sixteen instead of a cap she wore black lace over her head pinned with gold brooches her white hair curled naturally over a low forehead her complexion showed care and powder her eyes were still bright not with the effete intelligence of old age but with actual potency she wore a loose black sack flowered in purple and over that a black lace mantle fastened with more gold brooches she played her game of solitaire rapidly impatiently and always won for she never hesitated to cheat to get out of a tight place or into a favorable one cheating with the quickness of a flash and forgetting it the moment afterward mr horace was as old as she but he looked much younger although his dress and appearance betrayed no evidence of an effort in that direction whenever his friend cheated he would invariably call her attention to it and as usual she would shrug her shoulders and say bah lose a game for a card and pursue the conversation he happened to mention mushrooms fresh mushrooms she threw down her cards before the words were out of his mouth and began to call jewels jewels mr horace pulled the bell cord but madame was too excitable for that means of communication she ran into the antechamber and put her head over the banisters calling jewels jewels louder and louder she might have heard jewels slippered feet running from the street into the corridor and upstairs had she not been so deaf he appeared at the door but where have you been here i have been raising the house a half hour calling you you have been in the street i am sure you have been in the street madame is very much mistaken answered jules with resentful dignity he had taken off his white apron of waiter and was disreputable in all the shabbiness of his attire as cook when madame forbids me to go into the street i do not go into the street i was in the kitchen i had fallen asleep what does madame desire smiling benevolently what is this i hear fresh mushrooms in the market eh madame fresh mushrooms in the market and you have not brought me any madame there are fresh mushrooms everywhere in the market waving his hand to show their universality everybody is eating them old pomponnet jules continued only this morning offered me a plate piled up high for ten cents idiot why did you not buy them if madame had said so but madame did not say so madame said soup jewels carrots rice counting on his fingers and the gumbo i have explained that that was an accident madame said soup enumerating his menu again madame never once said mushrooms but how could i know there were mushrooms in the market do i go to market that is it and jules smiled at the question thus settled if you had told me there were mushrooms in the market pursued madame 
persisting in treating jules as a reasonable being why did not madame ask me if madame had asked me surely i would have told madame yesterday caesar brought them to the door a whole bucketful for twenty-five cents i had to shut the door in his face to get rid of him triumphantly and you brought me yesterday those detestable peas ah shrugging his shoulders madame told me to buy what i saw i saw peas i bought them well understand now once for all whenever you see mushrooms no matter what i ordered you buy them do you hear no madame surely i cannot buy mushrooms unless madame orders them madame's disposition is too quick but i do order them stupid i do order them i tell you to buy them every day and if there are none in the market every day go away get out of my sight i do not want to see you ah it is unendurable i must i must get rid of him this last was not a threat as jules knew only too well it was merely a habitual exclamation during the colloquy mr horace leaning back in his armchair raised his eyes and caught the reflected portrait of madame in the mirror before him the reflection so much softer and prettier so much more ethereal than the original painting indeed seen in the mirror that way the portrait was as refreshing as the most charming memory he pointed to it when madame with considerable loss of temper regained her seat it is as beautiful as the past he explained most unnaturally for he and his friend had a horror of looking at the long long past which could not fail to remind them of what no one cares to contemplate out of church making an effort towards some determination which a subtle observer might have noticed weighing upon him all the evening he added and apropos of the past hang interrogated the old lady impatiently still under the influence of her irascibility about the mushrooms he moved his chair closer and bent forward as if his communication were to be confidential ah bah speak louder she cried one would suppose you had some secret to tell what secrets can there be at our age she took up her cards and began to play there could be no one who bothered herself less about the forms of politeness yes yes answered mr horace throwing himself back into his chair what secrets can there be at our age the remark seemed a pregnant one to him he gave himself up to it one must evidently be the age of one's thoughts mr horace's thoughts revealed him the old man he was the lines in his face deepened into wrinkles his white moustache could not pretend to conceal his mouth worsened by the loss of a tooth or two and the long thin hand that propped his head was crossed with blue distended veins at the last judgment it was a favorite quotation with him the book of our conscience will be read aloud before the whole company but the old lady deep in her game paid no more heed to his quotation than to him who made a gesture toward her portrait when was that painted josephine madame threw a glance after the gesture the time was so long ago the mythology of greece hardly more distant at eighty the golden age of youth must indeed appear an evanescent myth madame's ideas seemed to take that direction ah at that time we were all nymphs and you all demigods demigods and nymphs yes but there was one among us who was a god with you all the illusion a frequent one with mr horace was to madame's husband who in his day it is said had indeed played the god in the little arcadia of society she shrugged her shoulders the truth is so little of a compliment the old gentleman sighed in an abstracted way and madame although apparently absorbed in her game lent her ear it is safe to say that a woman is never too old to hear a sigh wafted in her direction Josephine, do you remember in your memory she pretended not to hear remember who ever heard of her forgetting but she was not the woman to say at a moment's notice what she remembered or what she forgot a woman's memory when i think of a woman's memory in fact i do not like to think of a woman's memory one can intrude in imagination into many places but a woman's memory 
Mr. Horace seemed to lose his thread. It had been said of him in his youth that he wrote poetry, and it was said against him. It was evidently such lapses as these that had given rise to the accusation, and as there was no one less impatient under sentiment or poetry than Madame, her feet began to agitate themselves as if jewels were perorating some of his culinary inanities before her, and a man's memory, totally misunderstanding him, it is not there that I either would penetrate, my friend, a man. When Madame began to talk about men, she was prompted by imagination just as much as was Mr. Horace when he talked about women. But what a difference in their sentiments! And yet he had received so little, and she so much, from the subjects of their inspiration. But that seems to be the way in life, or in imagination. That you should, he paused with the curious shyness of the old before the word love, that you too should marry seemed natural, inevitable, at the time. Tradition records exactly the same comment by society at the time on the marriage in question. Society is ever fatalistic in its comments. But the natural, the inevitable, do we not sometimes, I wonder, perform them as Jules does his accidents? Ah, do not talk about that idiot, an idiot born and bred. I won't have him about me. He is a monstrosity. I tell his grandmother that every day when she comes to comb me. What a farce, what a ridiculous farce comfortable existence has become with us. Fresh mushrooms in market, and bring me carrots. The old gentleman, partly from long knowledge of her habit, or from an equally persistent bend of his own, quietly held on to his idea. One cannot tell. It seems so at the time. We like to think it so. It makes it easier. And yet, looking back on our future, as we once looked forward to it. Eh, but who wants to look back on it, my friend? Who in the world wants to look back on it? One could not doubt Madame's energy of opinion on that question to hear her voice. We have done our future. We have performed it, if you will. Our future. It is like the dinners we have eaten. Of course, we cannot remember the good without becoming exasperated over the bad. But, shrugging her shoulders, since we cannot beat the cooks, we must submit to fate, forcing a queen that she needed at the critical point of her game. At sixteen and twenty-one, it is hard to realize that one is arranging one's life to last until sixty, seventy, forever, correcting himself as he thought of his friend, the dead husband. If Madame had ever possessed the art of self-control, it was many a long day since she had exercised it. Now she frankly began to show ennui. When I look back to that time, Mr. Horace leaned back in his chair and half closed his eyes, perhaps to avoid the expression of her face. I see nothing but lights and flowers. I hear nothing but music and laughter. And all, lights and flowers and music and laughter, seemed to meet in this room, where we met so often to arrange our inevitabilities. The word appeared to attract him. Josephine, with a sudden change of voice and manner, Josephine, how beautiful you were! The old lady nodded her head without looking from her cards. They used to say, with sad conviction of the truth of his testimony, the men used to say that your beauty was irresistible. None ever withstood you none ever could. That, after all, was Mr. Horace's great charm with Madame. He was so faithful to the illusions of his youth. As he looked now at her, one could almost feel the irresistibility of which he spoke. It was only their excuse, perhaps. We could not tell at the time. We cannot tell even now when we think about it. They said then, talking as men talk over such things, that you were the only one who could remain yourself under the circumstances. You were the only one who could know, who could will under the circumstances. It was their theory. Men can have only theories about such things. His voice dropped, and he seemed to drop, too, into some abysm of thought. Madame looked into the mirror, where she could see the face of the one who alone could retain her presence of mind 
under the circumstances suggested by mr horace she could also have seen had she wished it among the reflected bric-a-brac on the mantel the corner of the frame that held the picture of her husband but peradventure classing it with the past which held so many unavenged bad dinners she never thought to link it even by a look with her emotions of the present indeed it had been said of her that in past present and future there had ever been but the one picture to interest her eyes the one she was looking at now this however was the remark of the uninitiated for the true passion of a beautiful woman is never so much for her beauty as for its booty as the passion of a gamester is for his game not for his luck how beautiful she was it was apparently down in the depths of his abysm that he found the connection between this phrase and his last and it was evidently to himself he said it madame however heard and understood too in fact traced back to a certain period her thoughts and mr horace's must have been fed by pretty much the same subjects but she had so carefully barricaded certain issues in her memory as almost to obstruct their flow into her life if she were a cook one would say that it was her bad dinners which she was trying to keep out of remembrance you there he there she there i there he pointed to the places on the carpet under the chandelier he could have touched them with a walking stick and the recollection seemed just as close she was in truth what we men called her then it was her eyes that first suggested it my sotus the little blue flower the forget-me-not it suited her better than her own name we always called her that among ourselves how beautiful she was he leaned his head on his hand and looked where he had seen her last so long such an eternity ago it must be explained for the benefit of those who do not live in the little world where an illusion is all that is necessary to put one in full possession of any drama domestic or social that mr horace was speaking of the wedding night of madame when the bridal party stood as he described under the chandelier the bride and groom with each one's best friend it may be said that it was the last night or time that madame had a best friend of her own sex social gossip with characteristic kindness had furnished reasons to suit all tastes why madame had ceased that night to have a best friend of her own sex if gossip had not done so society would still be left to its imagination for information for madame never tolerated the smallest appeal to her for enlightenment what the general taste seemed most to relish as a version was that madame in her marriage had triumphed not conquered and that the night of her wedding she had realized the fact and to be frank had realized it ever since in short madame had played then to gain at love as she played now to gain at solitaire and hearts were no more than cards to her and bah lose a game for a card must have been always her motto it is hard to explain it delicately enough for these are the most delicate affairs in life but the image of myasotis had passed through monsieur's heart and myasotis does mean forget-me-not and madame well knew that to love monsieur once was to love him always in spite of jealousy doubt distrust nay unhappiness for to love him meant all this and more he was that kind of man they said whom women could love even against conscience madame never forgave that moment her friend at least she could put aside out of her intercourse unfortunately we cannot put people out of our lives god alone can do that and so far he had interfered in the matter only by removing monsieur it was known to notoriety that since her wedding madame had abandoned destroyed all knowledge of her friend and the friend she had disappeared as much as is possible for one in her position and with her duties what there is in blue eyes light hair and a fragile form to impress one i cannot tell 
but for us men it seems to me it is blue-eyed light-haired and fragile formed women that are the hardest to forget the less easy to forget corrected madam he paid no attention to the remark they are the women that attach themselves in one's memory if necessary to keep from being forgotten they come back into one's dreams and as life rolls on one wonders about them is she happy is she miserable goes life well or ill with her madame played her cards slowly one would say for her prosaically and there is always a pang when as one is so wondering the response comes that is the certainty in one's heart responds she is miserable and life goes ill with her then if ever men envy the power of god madame threw over the game she was in and began a new one such women should not be unhappy they are too fragile too sensitive too trusting i could never understand the infliction of misery upon them i could send death to them but not not misfortune madame forgetting again to cheat in time and losing her game began impatiently to shuffle her cards for a new deal and yet do you know josephine those women are the unhappy ones of life they seem predestined to it as others looking at madame's full charmed portrait are predestined to triumph and victory they unconscious in his abstraction of the personal nature of his simile never know how to handle their cards and they always play a losing game ha came from madame startled into an irate ejaculation it is their love always that is sacrificed their hearts always that are bruised one might say that god himself favors the black-haired ones as his voice sank lower and lower the room seemed to become stiller and stiller a passing vehicle in the street however now and then drew a shiver of sound from the pendant prisms of the chandelier she was so slight so fragile and always in white with blue in her hair to match her eyes and god knows what in her heart all the time and yet they stand it they bear it they do not die they live along with the strongest the happiest the most fortunate of us bitterly and raising his eyes to his old friend who thereupon immediately began to fumble her cards whenever in the street i see a poor bent broken woman's figure i know without verifying it any more by a glance that it is the wreck of a fair woman's feature whenever i hear of a bent broken existence i know without asking any more that it is the wreck of a fair woman's life poor mr horace spoke with the unreason of a superstitious bigot i have often thought since in large assemblies particularly in weddings josephine of what was going on in the women's hearts there and i have felt sorry for them and when i think of god's knowing what is in their hearts i have felt sorry for the men and i often think now josephine think oftener and oftener of it that if the resurrection trumpet of our childhood should sound some day no matter when out there over the old st louis cemetery and we should all have to rise from our long rest of oblivion what would be the first thing we should do and though there were a god and a heaven awaiting us by that same god josephine i believe that our first thought in awakening would be the last in dying confession and that our first rush would be to the feet of one another for forgiveness for there are some offences that must outlast the longest oblivion and a forgiveness that will be more necessary than god's own then our hearts will be bare to one another for if as you say there are no secrets at our age there can still be less cause for them after death his voice ended in the faintest whisper the table crashed over and the cards flew widespread on the floor before we could recover madame was in the antechamber screaming for jewels one would have said that from her face the old lady had witnessed 
the resurrection described by mr horace the rush of the spirits with their burdens of remorse the one to the feet of the other and she must have seen herself and her husband with a unanimity of purpose never apparent in their short married life rising from their common tomb and hastening to that other tomb at the end of the alley and falling at the feet of the one to whom in life he had been recreant in love she in friendship of course jules answered through the wrong door rushing in with his gas stick and turning off the gas in a moment we were involved in darkness and dispute but what does he mean what does the idiot mean he it was impossible for her to find a word to do justice to him and to her exasperation at the same time pardon madame it is not i it is the cathedral bell it is ringing nine o'clock but madame could hear it herself listen we could not see it but we were conscious of the benign toothless smile spreading over his face as the bell tones fell in the room but it is not the gas i pardon madame but it is the gas madame said jules put out the gas every night when the bell rings madame told me that only last night the bell rings i put out the gas will you be silent will you listen if madame wishes just as madame says but the old lady had turned to mr horace horace you have seen you know and it was a question now of overcoming emotion i i i a carriage my friend a carriage madame jules interrupted his smile to interrupt her she was walking around the room picking up a shawl here a lace there for she was always prepared against draughts madame continued jules pursuing her a carriage if madame would only listen i was going to say but madame is too quick in her disposition the carriage has been waiting since a long hour ago mr horace said to have it there in a half hour it was then she saw for the first time that it had all been prepared by mr horace the rest was easy enough getting into the carriage and finding the place of which mr horace had heard as he said only that afternoon in it on her bed of illness poverty and suffering lay the patient wasted form of the beautiful fair one whom men had called in her youth myasotis but she did not call her myasotis mon amour the old pet name although it had to be fetched across more than half a century of disuse flashed like lightning from madame's heart into the dim chamber Madavine came in counterflash from the curtained bed in the old days women or at least young girls could hazard such pet names one upon the other these think of it dated from the first communion class the dating period of so much of friendship my poor amour my poor poor divine the voices were together close beside the pillow i i began divine it could not have happened if god had not wished it interrupted poor amour with the resignation that comes alas only with the last drop of the bitter cup and that was about all if mr horace had not slipped away he might have noticed the curious absence of monsieur's name and of his own name in the murmuring that followed it would have given him some more ideas on the subject of woman at any rate the good god must thank him for having one affair the less to arrange when the trumpet sounds out there over the old st louis cemetery and he was none too premature for the old st louis cemetery as was shortly enough proved was a near reach for all three of the old friends end of a delicate affair by grace e king